Thank you. Uh, thanks for um, having me here today. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Nicole Dumont. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at the University of Waterloo. Um, and I'm here today to talk about some of my work on using vector symbolic architectures um, to build biologically inspired models, um, uh, spatial navigation, in particular uh, simultaneous uh, localization and mapping, or SLAM. So um, way back in the 1940s, um, Tolman, uh, Dr. Tolman absorbed, observed that rats exploring mazes uh, would discover shortcuts and proposed that they navigated uh, using a cognitive map, some sort of internal representation of the external environment built up um, from lots of local observations. Evidence for the idea that animals have um, some sort of internal uh, global representation of space has accumulated over time specifically due to um, recordings um, from the hippocampal uh, adrenal uh, circuit. Um, several families of spatially sensitive neurons have been discovered. The first such uh, discovery was that of place cells in the hippocampus. These neurons fire selectively at specific locations in the environment. Um, and other spatially sensitive neurons have been discovered as well. Uh, there are head direction cells that are sensitive to an animal's uh, uh, heading direction that are found in many brain regions. There are border cells found in the medial adrenal cortex um, and other areas that fire when an animal is near um, the boundaries of an environment. Also in the medial adrenal cortex are object vector cells where fire and fields are dependent on distance and direction to objects in an environment. And a particular note are grid cells, um, which activate at hexagonally tiled points um, in an environment. Um, and the, the phase, scale, and orientation of this hexagonal pattern varies amongst different um, grid cells. And these cells are believed to provide a basis or a coordinate system for um, hippocampal cognitive maps and are considered, are believed to be instrumental for path integration one of the most basic forms of spatial updating. So navigation is vital for the everyday function of animals. Um, and one of the most uh, basic components of navigation is spatial updating, with the cognitive process of keeping track of one's position relative to one's surroundings. Uh, spatial updating is the foundation of both vector-based and map-based navigational strategies. Maintaining a homing vector to important locations like shelter or food while moving through an environment requires updating those vectors um, continuously over time based on how you're moving through an environment. Uh, and building an internal cognitive map of environment also requires tracking one posi one's position relative to landmarks. The most basic form of spatial updating is um, something called path integration, in which self position estimates um, that an animal maintains uh, are updated using only uh, cues about self-motion. So if you're in a pitch black environment and blindfolded and you're asked to walk around and try and you know, uh, keep track of where you are relative to where you started. Um, many animals can perform this computation, um, though some animals are better than others. Uh, us humans, we'd probably struggle to do this very accurately, but rats are very good at this computation. Um, that's because humans rely more heavily on external visual cues, such as landmarks, um, in our environment to be able to navigate effectively. Uh, in practice, animals generally do not navigate in the absence of pitch black environments. All of their, most of the external senses um, cut off. They have access to a floor of external sensory information, such as being able to see landmarks, uh, smell odor trails, all of which can be used to um, help correct the errors that would accumulate if you try to keep track of your position using self-motion cues alone. Such multi-sensory information obtained about an environment can be used in conjunction with path integration to create a cognitive, cognitive spatial maps of environments, um, finding together spatial and non-spatial features. Uh, 
in simultaneous localization and mapping, or SLAM, a well-studied problem in robotics, is exactly the sort of problem of trying to keep track of your position, do path integration, while simultaneously constructing an internal map that's computed using the result of the path integration, while at the same time using the result of the map to correct the, um, the estimate uh, maintained by path integration. So the goal of my research is to model some of these different con uh, spatial cognitive tasks, um, path integration and SLAM, uh, and better understand the brain regions related to um, spatial navigation, particularly the hippocampus, medial entorhinal cortex. My interest in spatial uh, cognition, uh, and the reason why you should be interested in too if you aren't already, is for a few reasons. First off, navigation is a core skill for which biological brains still far outperform our best artificial systems. And so understanding the neural mechanisms behind spatial navigation has important applications in AI and robotics, mobile ro robots and autonomous vehicles you need to be able to process spatial information um, and learn how to navigate uh, in the real world all its complexity. And we already know animals can do these sort of tasks every day. They can adapt flex flexibly to environmental changes and transfer their knowledge um, from navigation in one environment to another. Furthermore, understanding spatial cognition, it, it may not only provide insights um, uh, that could be applied to AI, but also um, provide insights to neuroscience more broadly. And there's grown evidence that the same neural mechanisms that underlie spatial representation may also underlie representation of continuous features in general. Um, including more abstract and conceptual ones. Um, this picture here that shows these little silhouettes of a bird with different uh, leg and neck lengths um, is from some experiment where humans had to keep track of the ra those ratios of those lengths. Um, and they found um, hexagonally um, uh, symmetric firing patterns um, in certain brain regions, um, including that perhaps uh, something similar to how grid cells may represent space it may also be used for representing, you know, something like these variables um, within a visual, these continuous variables of neck length and leg length in, um, in a visual image. And if these mechanisms are more general, then studying spatial cognition is potentially a gateway to understanding um, some of the fundamental outcomes of the brain. Um, for representing continuous variables uh, and creating um, internal knowledge maps uh, based on this information. While the discovery of the very spatial, spatially sensitive neurons I've discussed uh, provides valuable cues, clues into these neural mechanisms, it alone does not reveal the brain's underlying algorithms. But through computational modeling and attempting to re reverse engineer the brain's algorithms we can propose, test, and validate candid al algorithms. Um, I believe something that's key to, um, to this approach is to link high-level symbolic descriptions of representation algorithms to low-level low neural um, uh, observations of things like grid and place cells. So this brings us to the role that uh, vector symbolic architectures can play in this. So my work is built upon, uh, is built using the semantic pointer architecture or SPA, which combines a particular type of um, vector symbolic architecture, BSA, with uh, the neural engineering framework. I'll first discuss the uh, BSA side of things. I'm sure all of this is gonna be a basic review for the viewers here, but for the sake of completeness, uh, let's go through some of the uh, ideas and terminologies that I'm using. Uh, in vector symbolic architectures, symbols and structured uh, compositions of symbols are represented as high dimensional vectors. Algebraic operations defined over a vector space correspond to operations on these symbols. Typically, these operations include um, some sort of similarity measure, a bundling operation, and a binding, oper a binding operation, and an inverse operation. In SPA, uh, holographic reduced representations are used. In this particular uh, setup, uh, the cosine similarity 
is used to measure semantic similarity between symbols represented as these vectors. The bundling operation um, is implemented using vector addition. This maps a um, set of vectors, adding them together to a single vector, such that the result is similar to all of the inputs uh, in the set. The binding operation, um, polygraph produced representations, is uh, circular convolution. So this maps pair vectors to a new vector that is dissimilar to both. Um, there's a way of binding symbols together uh, to create a novel symbol. For example, combining um, a slot and filler representation. You could, for instance, bind um, the vector representation of color with the vector representation of, of red, um, for instance, something that is red in color. And then the inverse operation um, undoes the effect of binding. Um, and setup can be done uh, easily done approximately. While VSAs um, prescribe these operations for manipulating symbols, they do not prescribe how the mapping from symbols to vectors is done usually. Oftentimes random vectors of high dimensionality are used um, in the case where you want um, all of your symbols to be distinct from one another. Sometimes machine learning techniques may be used to obtain vector representations. Um, but when working with representations of numbers, there's a natural mapping to use. Say, for example, I want to represent an integer, um, this vector symbolic architecture. I can take a random vector, a random high dimensional vector to represent one, and then I combine it with itself to represent two, and then bind it with itself again to represent three, and so on and so forth. And this repeated self binding uh, to represent integers makes counting and addition uh, quite easy. Binding two vectors um, this way corresponds to addition of the underlying uh, numbers they represent, and unbinding corresponds to subtraction. And to represent a general integer n, um, here I can use uh, the, the relationship between the discrete Fourier transform and circular convolution. Um, binding two vectors together, a and b, um, is equivalent to taking um, the discrete Fourier transform, d of t, of each of these vectors and multiplying them together element wise, and then taking the inverse Fourier transform of the result. So, in this way, we can write the integer representation of a number n as the Fourier transform of our one vector, some sort of base, basis vector, um, raised element wise to the power n and then take the inverse discrete Fourier transform of the result. And this naturally extends uh, to representing um, real value numbers. Simply use a real value number in place of n here. Um, I'm gonna be referring to these sorts, these types of continuous variable representations as spatial semantic pointers. Um, but there's um, many terms used in the literature uh, to describe this uh, fractional bi binding, uh, power encoding. Here to represent um, some n-dimensional variable x with an s-dimensional, a d-dimensional um, uh, spatial semantic pointer, s of x, um, it's given as follows. I can write the um, Fourier transform of some under um, um, in this case where I just had a um, just represented a single number uh, scalar. I could write the um, Fourier transform of this one vector as e to the i times some vector a. Um, and uh, I can write it in this way. Uh, and writing it this way, I'm assuming that the um, components of the Fourier transform of this one vector all have a magnitude of one. Um, and this restriction will mean that the magnitude of this particular vector representation 
will be the same for all integers. So repeated binding um, won't cause the size of the vector to, to blow up. In a similar fashion to represent um, a higher dimensional um, continuous variable x, um, I can write this as e to the power of i times of um, a matrix A times X, or I'll call A the encoding matrix of the representation, let's say uh, D by N uh, matrix. And um, I require for this uh, that A has conjugate symmetries in the row so that the final S of X vector that I get will be real valued. Uh, sometimes with these sorts of um, power encoding representations, people just work in the Fourier domain frequently. Uh, which does simplify things a little bit, and is, but in many respects will be um, equivalent to what I'm going to be describing. So this representation is nice because binding in this uh, spatial semantic pointer space corresponds to uh, addition of the underlying vectors they represent. And I'm going to introduce here some methods for sort of visualizing these uh, vectors. Obviously, SSPs are going to be these high dimensional vectors, so we can't really visualize them directly, but we can understand the relationship um, to one another, um, the properties uh, in, in the following way. If I had um, an SSP, say, representing the origin, point zero. I can look at the similarity of it with SSPs representing points rooted across space, uh, maybe centered around the origin here, and plot the resulting similarities as a heat map. This helps visualize the relationship um, of SSPs um, representing one points to neighboring points. SSPs can be used in tandem with symbol like representations from standard VSAs. For example, I could have um, objects represented by some high objects like um, here snowman, seedling, and chair are represented by um, some random high dimensional vectors. And I can bind each of those vectors with their location as represented as an SSP in this fashion, and then bundle together, add together the results to create a compressed representation that associates all of these features with their locations, um, which is a type of spatial map. Here I'm plotting the result of if I took that compressed representation and then unbinded um, each of the uh, object symbol vectors and added together the result and looked at the similarity of it um, with SSPs that like, gridded over this space to see that the similarities in fact peaked at the location of these objects. Now, to create biologically realistic neural networks that make use of spatial semantic pointers, I require methods for representing vectors um, via the activity of spiking neurons um, and methods for performing computations on set of vectors via projections between different neural populations. Um, semantic pointer architecture involves not just um, the VSA as described so far, but also tools for modeling um, the operations of VSAs uh, with spiking neural networks using the neural engineering framework. The neural engineering framework can be described using a few basic principles. The first principle, representation, explains how the collective neural activity population can encode a vector. For example, if I have an SSP S representing some point X, um, then uh, the the ith neuron in the population representing it will be given by the following equation, uh, ai of t. This will be um, a spike trait. And in this equation, um, our terms uh, alpha i and beta i, uh, these are just, uh, these are called the gains and biases of the neuron. Uh, these are parameters that are randomly set, um, giving some range um, for different neurons to create a heterogeneous population. 
and they relate to the neurons uh, minimum and maximum firing rates, basically. Uh, this vector EI here is what's called the encoder of the neuron. Uh, encoders define what sort of input a particular neuron is sensitive to, hence capturing the receptive field of a neuron. In the case where neurons are part of a population representing SSPs, it might be natural to set encoders to be SSPs that represent random points across space. Uh, this would result in a population whose neurons are sensitive to particular spatial locations, um, i.e. either place cells. However, encoders can also be set to obtain grid cells um, when particular encoding matrices are used. Um, I won't get too much into the details of that. Um, but yeah, so the activity of a given neuron will be the dot product of these encoders with vector that are presented, multiplied by scan alpha plus this bias beta, and then um, passed through this nonlinear function. Uh, for me, it'll be a leaky integrating fire function to produce the resultant spike train. Not only can we encode vectors with the collective um, activity of a neural population, we can also decode the vectors represented by a neural uh, population with the second equation here. The neural activities are involved with a postsynaptic filter, H of T, which is just, uh, I'm just using a standard first order uh, low pass filter here. And the result is multiplied by this D vector called, the deco called a decoder. Um, it's another vector that's particular to each neuron. Then the result of this is added all together for all neurons. While these, um, while the E vectors that are specific to each neuron, the encoders, we set, um, uh, we preset these D vectors, the decoders, we solve for uh, using least squares optimization to compute the set that um, best approximately reconstructs um, here my vector S of X from uh, the activities. The neural engine framework um, not only describes how you can represent vectors, but also how you can do transformations on them using projections between neural populations. It's um, given by the transformation principle. This tells us how we can set uh, synaptic weights to compute a desired function. If here I have some population A it represents S and it provides input to another population B, then I'd like B to represent a function F of X. Uh, and I have example input out the data of S and F of S. Then least squares optimization can be used for, to solve for uh, decoders um, on the A population uh, that best approximates this transformation. Decoding, um, using these decoders on the A population um, and um, encoders on this post uh, B population is equivalent to just multiplying the filter activities of this first population A for weight matrix and feeding that current into the second population. So this is just a standard neural network, um, populations connected via weighted synapses. Only here just uh, the weight matrix is computed based on the decoders of A and the encoders of B. Since we set the encoders, sometimes randomly, sometimes often to match biological tuning curves, curves, for example, to create, obtain place cells or grid cells, um, this results in particular constraints on the weight matrix, which simplifies the optimization, uh, but potentially at the expense of accuracy. The last principle of the NEF um, is dynamics. Dynamical systems can be encoded in a currently connected population of spiking neurons. Um, and the NEF um, explains uh, how to set um, the weights on this, these recurrent connections um, so that the population implements some particular dynamical system.
So some of these tools um, are briefly sketched out in mind. We can move to discussing uh, the details of some of my particular some of my models. Starting with just the task of localization, so basic path integration. Say we have an agent, you can think of it as a robot or an animal, uh, traveling through space. Its true location is given by some vector, x, that varies over time. But the agent doesn't have knowledge of x. Instead, um, it has a time varying, it maintains a time varying SSP, that represents an estimation of its location over time. And this SSP must be continuously updated using only um, knowledge of the agent's instantaneous velocity. So using only self motion cues. For this computation, we can derive uh, the dynamics of an SSP relate to the velocity the underlying variable it represents. If we compute what the rate of change in SSP is, then it will be equal to itself bound with um, what I call here the log of an SSP representing uh, the velocity x dot. What's exactly happening is clear in the frequency domain. In the frequency domain, the dynamics of each component of an SSP are independent of one another. The dynamics of the JF component of an SSP in the Fourier domain are given by um, the following equation here, which is uh, just the formula for just the equation of a simple harmonic oscillator um, whose frequency omega here is the dot product between the agent's velocity and the JF row of the encoded matrix that defines the SSP representation. So this is an example. S since we have an oscillator here whose frequency is modulated um, in some way by velocity, this is called a velocity controlled oscillator. And structures like this um, appeared in many past models of path integration um, that were created without any use of VSAs. The connection between this popular class of path integration models and the dynamics of uh, continuous VSA representations was an unexpected but uh, pleasant surprise. We can visualize um, a bit more what's happening to an SSP um, as the variables representing x um, changes over time. Each of the components of the SSP in the Fourier the frequency domain um, will have magnitude one, so they'll lie somewhere on the unit circle in the complex plane. Over time, this component will oscillate about the unit circle as x changes. Um, with the frequency of this oscillation uh, modulated by uh, the agent's velocity. Basically, when the agent's velocity aligns with uh, the corresponding row, of the coding matrix corresponds to this particular component. Um, the frequency of oscillation will be very high. And when the frequency is perpendicular to this row vector in the encoding matrix, the frequency will be zero. And this component will stand still in the complex plane. Basically, each component of the SSP in the Fourier domain is integrated motion in a particular direction that is sensitive. And the encoding matrix defines all the directions of this motion, of this integration. So we could implement this um, using a spiking neural network, the tools of the NEF, but we would run into some problems. A well-known issue with velocity controlled oscillators in general um, is that noise causes drift in the oscillators and their accuracy quickly deteriorates. And this noise will become even more acute when using spiking neurons, which are inherently noisy. However, these oscillator dynamics can be modified to improve stability. I can replace the simple harmonic oscillator dynamics that describe how um, each Fourier component, the SSP evolves over time, uh, substitute the dynamics of instead a nonlinear oscillator that has a stable limit cycle, um, radius one. Uh, this visualization shows the difference the left here of um, the mix of a simple harmonic oscillator versus the nonlinear oscillator. Um, 
with a stable limit cycle that I'm using. Adding these attractor dynamics um, makes the model much more robust to noise drift. So using these, um, using these pieces, we can create a spike in neural network that actually implements these dynamics. A population of speed and head direction cells will represent the velocity um, of the agent. And this is the um, only input we receive. This is projected onto a set of neural populations. Each neural population will represent um, one of the components of the SSP in the frequency domain. So it's representing its real and imaginary part along with the frequency at which it's oscillating. I'll call these um, VCO or velocity control oscillator populations. Um, we only need um, four of D over two such populations since the conjugate symmetry of the encoded matrix makes the additional Fourier terms redundant. Each of these oscillator populations will be recurrently connected to itself um, with weight set to approximate the um, attractor oscillator dynamics using the tools of the neural engineering framework. The collective activity of all populations can be used to compute um, will result in SSP um, since a point X that is changing over time. So here's some examples of um, uh, some results um, in this. Here I have these two pictures on the left column of this dotted black line. This is some true path that the agent's following. Um, and this path integration model, it only receives information about the initial point uh, that the agent is in, and then velocity information over time. And it has to, with these oscillator populations, maintain an estimate of the SSP of its location, um, uh, given this velocity input. And if I look at the SSP it's representing and find, um, decode out what position X it's representing, I can plot the result. Here is these gray lines that are underneath the dotted black lines. So they show how good the model's estimate of its location is compared to its true location over time. Also in these plots, I have these red dots. So these are some examples of um, some of the spiking activity recorded from different neurons in these um, oscillator populations during the path integration task. One thing you may notice is that the neurons here have these uh, clear banded stripe patterns, but um, as is clearest in the, uh, the path that's shown on the bottom, this wiggly spiral one, these um, stripes only appear in certain parts of the space. Um, that's because these neurons have um, a uh, sensitivity um, also to head direction. So they fire in these stripe patterns, but only when the animal is heading in a particular direction. On the right here, I have um, spikes of these particular neurons. Um, Bind based on what the heading direction of the animal was, uh, spikes, um, and you can see there's a clear sensitivity to particular directions. Cells with sort of abandoned stripe patterns like this have been found in some of the deeper layers of the medial internal cortex, um, along with conjunctive cells uh, that have a um, mix of spatial patterned activity and head direction sensitivity. But band cells are not as common as grid cells, um, not nearly as well studied. Here's some other examples of um, the output contained from this path integration model. Here it's tested on a minute long path 
that's randomly generated from frequency bounded white noise signals. The black dotted line here shows the true location of the agent and the blue lines show the model's estimate of location over time. Let's compute this path, of path integration. Uh, here I'm using um, SSPs with dimension 151 and using a um, total of uh, 75,000 spiking neurons in the model. And um, it's been, it can be do path integration on both 2D and 3D paths, as shown in these examples. Here are some results of infinite long paths also generated from frequency bounded uh, white noise signals, averaged over 10 different trials. This is using slightly fewer neurons than before, only 600 per oscillator population, uh, to better see how error accumulates over time. So what these results are plotting is um, the similarity of the SSP that's currently represented by the neural population, um, the similarity of that to the SSP represented in the agent's true location over time. If this is very high, close to one, it's perfectly representing, um, it's, very, it's very accurately representing uh, the agent's location and the lower it is, uh, less accurate this representation is. I have two lines here, um, this purple one, which is what I just described, but also this uh, pinkish one. This is the similarity of what's represented by the model to the SSP that it is most similar to. So here, if these, the similarity to the closest SSP is high, it means the model's accurately representing an SSP of some location, but it may not be very close to the true location of the agent. If um, this similarity to closest SSP is low, then the model's failing to even represent a valid SSP. Um, the lower this is, the more accurate any results of decoding at the location will be. So we can see that um, this model at first is maintaining a good representation of an SSP that is close to the true location um, in the first few seconds. And slowly both these values decay over time. Um, the decay of the similarity to the exact SSP uh, uh, going lower. On the right here, I'm plotting the distance between the model's estimate of its location compared to its true location, the agent's true location, which is low, but uh, increases quite high after here around 40 seconds. Um, the path integration model, since um, you're only integrating these in velocities and not given any corrections, errors can only accumulate over time. It's only a matter of how fast. Um, here are the same results, same sort of things as, as described, but um, for integration over three-dimensional paths, you can see that the similarity uh, decays more rapidly. So path integration on its own is not very accurate. Uh, there's no mechanism to correct the errors that accumulate, um, but with additional information from the environment, sensory cues, landmarks, et cetera, the spatial updating can be done with great accuracy. So this brings us um, to a model of simultaneous localization and mapping uh, using VSAs. So now the problem is, while transverse an environment, the agent has some true location that is unknown to it. All it knows is its self-motion, its velocity over time. But unlike before now, the agent can also observe uh, landmarks um, within some radius of itself. And if it's exploring the same space, um, going over loops, uh, and seeing the same landmarks over and over again, then it can use its memory of these landmarks locations uh, to correct its estimate um, of self-position. Here's a high level overview of how this um, called SSP SLAM model um, works. 
Let's go through chunk by chunk. So first we have the path integrator, as we've already described. This implements dynamics of um, these representations of continuous variables, um, SSPs, using velocity input. Next, we have um, what I call the environment map. Here, a map of the environment is stored in the form of a heteroassociative memory. So I have this, um, these two layers of neurons. One encodes a vector representation, say vector B, of current features in sight. So these would be the um, vector representations of symbols like uh, tree, building, um, bench, et cetera. And we can think of this as input that's coming from other brain regions involved in item, uh, object identification. The output of this, this um, neural population projects to another that should represent the um, uh, current memory of those features locations uh, as given by SSPs, your SB. However, these feature locations are not given to the agent. They must be learned over time, given local observations of landmarks. The input the agent does receive is a sort of egocentric feature, is ego representation, an egocentric representation of feature locations. So while moving through space, once it's close enough to a feature to observe it, it's given as input um, an SSP representing the vector between itself and the features. Neurons in this population will fire selectively when the agent is a particular direction, direction um, and, orient, and orientation away from uh, some feature or like object and mark, et cetera. This sort of activity, sort of activity patterns will resemble the, uh, that of object vector cells uh, found in the medial internal cortex, which track um, an animal's uh, vector away from objects uh, currently in view in its environment. So using um, the output of the path integrator, a representation of self-position, and then what I previously described, a representation of a vector to nearby objects, since binding in the SSP space corresponds to addition in the underlying vector space, those two outputs can be bound together to create a estimate of the features locations um, in the environment as a whole globally. And this result um, can be used in turn to compute an error signal that will drive um, uh, learning of the um, projections from these uh, the feature symbols to uh, the memory of their locations uh, using um, what's a uh, prescriptive error sensitivity learning rule, which I'm not going into detail on here, but um, what type of uh, um, supervised learning rule. Um, So as an agent explores an environment, it keep it'll keep track of its location using the path integrator and observe features and landmarks in the environment and use that to learn um, this map between feature symbols and their locations. Once this is learned, if it um, comes upon a feature that it's seen before, um, it can remember where it thought that feature was located in the environment and use that information to correct the path integrator, the output of the path integrator model, which by this point of time um, may have accumulated more errors and drifted away from uh, the correct answer. So what's done um, is that the um, Memory of feature locations can be bound with the inverse of this SSP representation of the vector between the agent and these features to obtain an estimate of self-position. 
and this corrects the path integrator. Here's some example results. So here I have on the left, this loop, this agent is going around this black line. This is its true path it's following. And these little symbols of like candy cane and door and such are um, objects at point locations that it observes along the path. And it's gonna go along um, this path in a loop um, four times. After going along the loop once or twice, um, it should learn the location of these features and then be able to use that to correct um, its es the model's estimate of its location over time, uh, the output of the path integrator model. And with these lines here, I have um, the results of using just the path integrator model, not any of the SLAM stuff, not using any knowledge of these, um, these features or landmarks. Uh, this is given by the green and orange lines. Um, you can see that it maintains, a, it has a very accurate estimate of location early on that slowly decays over time, as we described um, seen previously. Well, in uh, purple and uh, pink here, I have the results of using this full SLAM system. Um, and the similarity of the estimate location when um, object locations are used um, to provide corrections is higher um, as time goes on than the path integrator model. In this case, it's only a little bit higher. So it's only doing a little bit better um, than without the help of these feature locations. And here I have another example of, in this case, um, agent traveling along a slightly more complicated loop-de-loop -loop in an environment, given by this orange line. And as it travels along this path, it observes these symbols, this red triangle, um, green star, uh, blue square, et cetera, at some random points. Then it observes um, some walls, these black bars, these lines here. On the right is the output of uh, the model's um, estimate of self-position over time. And then it goes all over this loop four times. And you can see that there's some of these blue lines that follow the real path. The model's able to accurately follow the path for a short time, but eventually um, what's represented by the model has decayed so far um, from the true answer. And not just the true answer, but from any SSP that it's, um, it's not actually even representing a valid location. So when plotting um, the, trying to plot what actual position it's representing, you get this noisy mess because it's um, not really actually accurately representing any position. Um, on the left here, I have um, plotted uh, the, uh, best guess is the position represented by the model over time, uh, basically up to the path integrator, when the full SLAM system is used. So the location of these objects in the wall are used to provide corrections. You can see here that it's able to, uh, to follow a path um, more accurately for longer. Um, and there's less noise. There is some, so it has decayed some um, at certain points particularly when it's away from any objects, uh, but by observing objects, it's able to correct itself. So this is a fairly simple SLAM model. Um, I'd like to show how uh, VSAs can be applied um, for these sort of tasks. Here are the, um, I have biologically inspired spatial navigation systems which can be modeled using spatial semantic pointers um, and could also be modeled using related extensions of VSAs uh, to continuous variables. What's interesting is that the dynamics um, given by just the definition of these sorts of continuous extensions naturally leads to model also path integration. They use these velocity controlled oscillators, um, which is a popular class of models 
uh, model for this sort of tool. And using the language of VSAs, um, we can describe a SLAM algorithm uh, that works by binding and um, unbinding um, symbols and uh, SSP representations of continuous variables. And in these models, a variety of spatially sensitive uh, cell types can be obtained. Um, and things from uh, grid cells to place cells to object vector cells. The path integration model uh, in particular suggests um, an important role played by band cells in navigation, which is a cell type that has not been uh, very well explored in um, past experiments, uh, but is the basis of path integration um, in these models. Another possibility is that real path integration systems are more complicated. Perhaps band cells aren't involved in path integration. But this model could be made more complex for future work. Um, to take this into account. One could implement coupling schemes between uh, different Fourier components to improve robustness to noise. In particular, coupling schemes um, could be derived that would result in neurons with more grid cell-like activity patterns. Uh, this is a potential avenue of future research. Uh, another areas of current and future research involved in this work uh, include learning multiple maps for different environments um, and examining revamping effects, as well as creating uh, more complex cognitive maps, combining discrete and continuous features, and adding uh, action selection to the mix um, for environment exploration. So just to give you a taste of um, some of the directions in which um, VSAs can be used uh, applied to spatial navigation. Uh, and that's all the content I have. Um, before I uh, give the floor uh, to any questions or comments, uh, I'd like to take a moment just to thank my colleagues here at Waterloo for their support, their contributions to our research, particularly my advisors, Chris Eli Smith and Jeff Orchard, uh, and also Michael Furlong, a postdoc who's doing a ton of great work um, using these spatial cements um, to explore uh, uh, Bayesian optimization. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much for this great talk. So now we have some time for questions. Please unmute your microphones and speak up. Maybe I can I can start with a simple question, but I, I bet you uh, somehow covered it in your future uh, research directions. So I'm I'm thinking about application of of the method that you have pre presented in more practical scenarios like uh, SLAM for robotics in complex environments. So uh, how far are we from this method being? used practically used in this realistic settings mm -hmm. so yeah it's um there's a bit of gap between this and actual motion uses in practice in robotics um namely some of the missing components are you need systems to do object um recognition using raw sensory data to be able to get the symbols of different objects um and um obtaining things like vectors to features um, in your environment using sensory readings, that's pretty straightforward, but it's mostly the object rec recognition side that um, is where it's lacking currently. Uh, and, and then I'm also thinking, oh, again, cor correct me if I'm drifting in totally different direction, but for example, a map uh, or uh, learned in this way by an agent, uh, uh, how uh, how much transferable it is to, to another agent, so to say, I mean, how this map can be shared as an experience to another agent so that uh, it can navigate, he or she or it can na navigate in, this, in the same environment. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's an interesting question. Um... 
I, I, I mean, so we we had a, we had a talk on slam and the, like classical slam, so non neural slam, uh, even in this uh, winter session, and uh, their slam is um, more or less uh, boils down to finding uh, more similar scene. I mean, the description of sin. And, and th this, in a way, I mean, it's kind of transferable. So you, you just put the database with images to, to another agent, and uh, that's more or less it. But, uh, but I mean, here you kind of learn, you, 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 you create the, the path. I mean, as, a, as an ex so it's a kind of personal, per personal experience of an agent. So how much is it transferable in this way? Um, so, even if you're going to an agent with a different new agent going along a different path, um, the first agent, it does learn global loca um, locations of features globally. Um, so those would still be applicable to a new agent as long as they still have the same origin or reference frame that the SSPs were described in. Um, so, um, You could, if you had, instead of just learning the mapping from uh, symbols to their locations represented as SSPs, which are learned, if you had a mapping from, um, if you also learned a mapping from their locations to um, um, uh, their sim um, to their symbols bound with their location, I don't want to say which you could learn in a similar. I believe you could also learn that. Um, you could then. After an agent's explored the environment and it's learned that mapping, if you now pass it in an SSP that represents the space as a whole, um, then you could obtain from that basically a, a list of all of the objects in the space represented as symbols, vectors, bound of their locations. Um, so that would be sort of a complete map, which could then be given to another agent as long as it has sort of the same origin for the SSPs. So same reference frame. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. So, more questions? Yeah, I have one whole bunch. Yeah, go on. Well, you muted yourself. Uh, we don't hear you. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, um, yep. there's a. Uh, coffee grinder is going. Um, <laughs> thank you for the, uh, it, it, actually it gave me a lot of ideas. Um, uh, one of the things is, is the oscillators uh, speak to me of dynamical theory. Um, how much of that uh, are you aware of uh, is invading um, your work? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, I do, I've used um, the results of dynamical theory to be able to construct, you know, the nonlinear oscillator dynamics that I've used here to have that stable limit cycle, uh, just to improve robustness. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm wondering what you have in mind. But... Um, it's foggy notions at this point in time, but uh, what you're uh, actually uh, showing there um, has a lot of applications. It works out uh, way beyond, I guess, uh, animal behavior. And it has a lot of object behavior of, of uh, let's say, cruise missile looking for something on an ocean, et cetera, those types of, of, of uh, applications. And um, the the real problem is, is you get into the application of the of the actual um, mathematics, if you will, and um, you get kind of well. I could do this. I could do that. I could well. You could see that you have a you have an exponential explosion, basically. Um, the uh, and you, you get back to um, who makes the money is one of the discussions that we always seem to have. Um, and that's where uh, we're seeing uh, as a research, uh, commercial research entity, 
um, we're seeing people saying, well, just who does make the money here? Um, and it leads to some very uh, significant um, parts of the mathematics, if you will. And what we're seeing is, is the similarity is one, and the other is, is um, how um, the dynamics of the system work along with, uh, say, uh, VSA, hyperdimensional computing. Um, and uh, we're coming to some, I guess, conclusions right now in that particular area. And we're finding that dynamical systems are probably, their integration is probably not as uh, well understood as we, we really should. We sh and we should not acknowledge that. Um, but um, I really found uh, your, uh, your presentation stimulating. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Gil, for your comment. Uh, any more questions? So we have time for maybe a last question. Uh, Nicole, could, when, when you presented the results um, for your uh, your one minute runs, what what's the effective update time? Is it one second or is it less than one second? Um, so um, the simulation of the spiking neuron, uh, of the spiking neurons is um, has a time step of um, zero point zero zero one seconds. Um, so, uh, so, you, so are you conti continuous? How are you? How are you representing the, the instantaneous velocity? How how's, is that? How's, um, how's that being translated as an input vector to the to the neural network circuit? Really, is what I'm asking. Okay. Um, yeah. So the I compute the instantaneous velocity um, using finite differences in the path. Um, the time scale of, of that the simulation runs on, um, and it does just receive um, the velocities rather than them represented as an SSP, um, which could be something uh, done differently. That'd be interesting. Um, what's really most important is that the model though receives um, these velocities weighted by this encoded matrix um, to obtain the frequencies. Um, okay. And, so what what I was trying to get at is that essentially you're creating a bundled vector as the memory, and we know with um, we we know what the sort of capacity bundling capacity is for HRR and other VSA schemes. I'm just wondering if you've got any thoughts about the length of the memory as a as a function of the bundling capacity uh, of these vectors. That would be yeah, that would be an interesting. Um to explore is what's known about the representational capacity. Um, yeah, because I mean, the, the, I'll, I'll, I'll send you, I'll, I'll send you a, a link to a paper, um, not, not by me, but by others, uh, looking at the bundling capacity for, for different VSA schemes. It would be very interesting to know if where you, where you suddenly lose the sensitivity is a consequence of the bundling capacity of the essentially the vector that you're is, is you're memorizing. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Mm, thank you, Graham. Well, uh, last chance to ask Nicole a question. Well, if um, there are no more questions, I would like to um, uh, still a second of your attention before I let you go for a summer vacation. So I want uh, I want to show our beautiful web page. And uh, as I have already said in the beginning, so we with this talk, this uh, excellent talk, we have completed four, uh, the fourth season uh, of the webinars, which is great. And I have already created a template, so a placeholder for uh, for the full session of uh, VSA Online. So, um, well, now it's uh, pretty uh, empty. So as I said, so I just managed to uh, create a, templ a template, but I uh, can assure you that I have already a number of confirmed interesting talks so stay tuned and have a great summer so thank you all for 
been with us uh, this uh, season. So that's it uh, for me. And thank you, Nicole, for this great talk. Evgeny, thank you very much for organizing all the webinars. It's been great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And uh, so I hope to see you all uh, soon again after summer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah.